Welcome to the February GMOX meeting. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, so, uh, first piece of news, uh, I'm just going to give a quick news real that um, is we didn't get to see after this, but there's a seminar, a Center for Synthetic Biology seminar that's happening next week, 2 to 3, on February 28th, Ryan, 4003. It's actually a, uh, a, person, a professor candidate, a person trying out for a job. You know, they, they might be more successful. So that should be cool. They're reshaping the immune response to the life of engineering. Uh, so, yes, very, very uh, interesting. You don't know how to sell stuff. Um, so, I'm starting off with the, the news with just a couple of uh, interviews uh, uh, that are online with cool symbiote people. The first one is Christina Agapakis. She's the creative director at Ginkgo Bioworks now. Uh, she's a George Church alum, and she has lots of cool things to say. She's also a cool person to follow on Twitter. Twitter is um, and then the other uh, the other profile that I really liked was of Jean-Tien Lunshaw, who is a bioethicist in George Church's lab who makes sure they don't accidentally turn the world into a market out of um, uh, yeah. uh, Speaking of things that uh, could come out of a market out of novel, uh, bio pirates are a thing. Uh, this guy, Wei Shang Cheng, uh, was convicted this month of attempting to steal genetically modified rice from his employer, Ventria Biosciences in Kansas, uh, to bring back to China. So, biosecurity, biocontainment, biopiracy, all real things. Um, in sort of industry news, there we go. Um, IndieBio, which is the uh, biotech accelerator in San Francisco, uh, released its uh, debut, its fourth class of startups. Um, and uh, some of my favorites are Venomics, which is a company that's trying to use Symbio to develop a universal anti-venom that can work against all things venoms. Um, Rivada Solutions, which is a company that's doing high throughput uh, embryo editing for animals so far. Mm -hmm. um, Scale Biolabs is a company that uh, did a lot of, that is making microfluidic cell culture chips. So basically make mentally cell culture experiments much smaller, cheaper, and more precise. And then Catalog uh, DNA Technologies is a company that is relevant to one of our speakers today. Uh, they're doing DNA data. Um, and so, oh, and if you're interested in hearing more about these companies and the other ones that uh, debuted, the video of the demo day where they do all their presentations is available on YouTube. So you can look that up. There's a link to that in the original. Yeah. So I'm obviously going to talk about Christmas this month. It's a pretty big month for Christmas. And the first thing that happened is that the road was awarded the patent for uh, doing Christmas in the area. Uh, now, this is. Some of the original because UC Berkeley is obviously going to school, uh, and UC Berkeley still has the patent for uh, creating a single guy around. So what may end up happening is that they just do a patent sharing thing anyway. Um, but this is a big victory for the pros. Uh, and uh, Jennifer Downa uh, is sort of upbeat about it. She says, they have a patent on green tennis balls, we have a patent on all tennis balls. Um, not, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you, uh, a lot of people are not happy about it, in particular Michael Eisen is not happy. Um, so this is the UC Berkeley professor who is also planning to announce that he's going to run for California, uh, the Senate team in California. Um, and he wrote on his excellent blog um, an article called Patents are Destroying the Soul of Academic <coughs> Science. Uh, in the wake of this decision, basically uh, arguing that the patent court's decision was uh, primarily based on Jennifer Dowden being a good and cautious scientist and not overstating the research that she had done. And that basically the road won by overstating the stuff and playing the patent game. And that the result of all this is everyone's going to hide their research until they publish it, until they patent it, and the free exchange of ideas is going to. Uh, decrease in terms of uh, all this patent stuff. Um, all that being said, UC uh, Berkeley is not super uh, discouraged by this decision because they just announced $125 million in funding for uh, CRISPR research into uh, agricultural plants and microbiomes. And I think that means sort of like the microbiome as opposed to like the microbiome, uh, like all, all microbes. 
So if you want to do any group of research related to that, UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco are a uh, good place to go in the next few years. Um, in addition, the National Academy of Sciences uh, released the uh, report on the ethics of germline editing in humans that they've been working on for a year. And they basically said, yeah, we should go forward carefully, cautiously with germline editing in humans to treat diseases for which there are no reasonable alternative therapies. What are reasonable alternative therapies? They didn't specify super well. But the, I thought the really interesting thing was they said that while we shouldn't do any work genetically enhancing humans right now, they didn't close the door to it. And they also uh, sort of rejected the argument that any genetic enhancing of humans would necessarily lead to like massive level of inequality. So there's a, there's a maybe there. And they seem like they're a little bit ahead of the American public. A Pew Research poll recently showed that there's much more worry than enthusiasm in the American public for uh, the idea of genetic uh, if the American public is worried about that, and they really need to prepare for uh, the end of sex, uh, which is my book recommendation. It's actually the, the end of sex uh, for the old fashioned reproductive purposes in the middle class in developed nations over the next 40 years. <laughs> this is like, it's a little less punchy that way. But, uh, <laughs> So this guy, Hank Greeley, is a Stanford law professor, and he wrote this book basically arguing about the convergence of two technologies. One, in vitro gametogenesis, that's going to allow you to basically take induced where both stem cells and turn them into egg cells. And two, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which we already have, are going to combine to make it really easy to just make tons and tons of embryos in vitro and then screen them for, uh, to make sure they don't have diseases and potentially to look for uh, non-disease traits that you want. Um, and it's a very interesting book, and it walks through the argument of why all this stuff is probably going to end up being legal based on like precedent. Um, and so I recommend it a lot. Um, moving on to sort of new research papers, um, I, I thought this one was really cool. Uh, this uh, uh, Pooh uh, et al. Uh, in, in Dickinson lab um, engineered this RNA polymerase uh, and they used uh, phage-assisted continuous evolution to basically turn it into a really, really modular, easy to modify sensor. Uh, so basically, they split the RNA polymerase in two, and then they evolved it for a long time to, to find ones that would be active only when it was being dimerized by a specific protein group interaction they refused to, and inactive otherwise. And because of that, they were able to, uh, uh, and because they engineered it to be sort of uh, linker independent and, and confirmation independent, they were able, once they had this working thing, to basically swap out the protein interaction domains and get great activity uh, within with no additional security required. So they were able to show, um, they were, you used this uh, light-induced dimerization uh, pair of domains and then got 26-fold enhancement in transcription, and then they used a uh, rapamycin binding uh, pair of domains and they got 340-fold enhancement, and this was just swapping out the binding domains with no additional engineering. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, David Baker lab continues to be David Baker's lab, um, and he continues to do a really cool thing. Uh, this month, they figured out how to engineer pockets into, uh, beta sheet, uh, into beta sheets. And they use that to design a bunch of small proteins with arbitrarily shaped binding pockets in them. And the coolest one I thought was this one because the binding pocket was so large that it like this and glycol molecule in it. And this is nice because uh, potentially in the future, now you can, instead of when you want to do an enzyme engineering thing, instead of like looking for an existing enzyme that has sort of the right binding site structure and uh, catalytic activity to kind of start your thing, you might be able to just design it from scratch. Um, on the metabolic engineering front, uh, as you guys probably know, there's, all, there's this competition at all times between uh, you know, getting your microbe to make the product you want it to, and getting your microbe to be happy and grow. And one good way to sort of split the difference is uh, engineering your microbe so that it grows to a high density, and then once it's at a high density, it switches off its growing genes and switches on its major molecule genes. Um, and that's what these uh, these guys did. Who did in Profiter Lab? Um, they basically engineered quorum sensing in the E. 
uh, the E. coli such that uh, once the bacteria reached a, a certain density, they would shut off sort of essential carbon metabolism genes that were like siphoning off the metabolites that were being used for the metabolic engineering purposes. And they showed that their, their best engineered strain produced a lot of, so the green is what they want, it's myonositol, and their best engineered strain produced a lot of myonositol and none of the waste products that they didn't want, which was acetate. Whereas the, these are strains that don't have that form sensing dynamic control of uh, the carbon flux, and they get a lot of waste and not very much desired molecules. And it was general, they were able to also make tons of glucaric acid and the waste as well. And then finally, uh, uh, some good news on the cell therapy front. Um, you guys might remember, if, if any of you went to like one of the first few meetings, I mentioned that uh, there was a little girl who had leukemia who was cured with um, universal CAR T cells, uh, which are basically CAR T cells where you knock out the receptors that would sense like non-self, uh, and then you just add in the chimeric receptor that targets the cancer, and you put those in the body, and they can't target anything except the cancer that's expressed in that receptor. Um, and so you don't need like the patient's own cells to be able to get them off the shelf. Um, and this literal Layla uh, was cured with that, and now in science translational medicine, um, there's this paper reporting both that she's still okay a year later, and also they've cured a second infant um, using the same technology. So basically, this is the, uh, these are biomarkers of the cancer cells uh, before the universal CAR T treatment, and then after the universal CAR T treatment. Um, and they're also, you're able to, uh, after the CAR T cells have done their thing, uh, you're able to get rid of the body and then replace uh, them with a healthy immune system that the child can have uh, with all the white blood cells. And this is the second patient, and it's the exact same thing. I think they actually optimized a little bit because the universal CAR T cells are way faster. Um, so yeah, that's really uh, good and exciting news. And there's a lot more articles um, uh, on the written version, but I didn't want to take up all the time with the two awesome presenters we have today. So, yeah, thanks for listening.